actress graced the airwaves of Melbourne and Australian radio in the great and halcyon days of the soap operas and the radio dramas that our next guest. And it's our pleasure tonight on Remember When to say good evening to Patricia Kennedy. Yes, Pat, nice to talk to you. How are you? Hello, Philip. Hello, Bruce. And hello, everybody. <laughs> Patricia, I know this is a nostalgia program and necessarily we go back and talk about the good old times, as we will with you tonight. Mm. But uh, the, the radio is of special love to me and your voice particularly as, uh, as I grew up with it. Well, that's very nice of you to say so. I, I love radio myself. I, I suppose as, as an actor, uh, the theatre has uh, special attractions for me, but I, I still love uh, radio, and um, I, I mean, I love acting in it. I think it's a wonderful medium for, for, for drama, and, and, and I love it, and it's my whole life here where I live in the bush because I, I don't have electricity, so I have no television, and I listen to the radio all the time. You're living north of Marimbula, aren't you, Patricia? That's right. I'm in between Marimbula and Bermagui. Um, and those who can remember um, will remember that Bermagui was made famous in the 30s by an American adventure writer named Zane Gray. And he was also a deep-sea fisherman. And he'd fished out all the um, uh, fishing areas around the Americas. And he came to Australia in the 30s. And, uh, and he fished uh, at Bermagui. And that really put Bermagui on the map. Perhaps before... Coastal Strip, yes. Before we move on, Patricia, how, how do you live without uh, electricity? I mean, it sounds very romantic, but <laughs> does it have its difficulties? No, not, no, not really, no. Um, uh, well, I have, uh, I have gas. I have gas for everything, and I have kerosene lamps. Oh, how lovely. Oh, we imagine candles all over the house, Patricia. Oh, no, no, I've got a kerosene lamp a light in front of me right now. And it looks very nice. It would be like something out of a stage play, Patricia. You think so? Yes. <laughs> I still have, and I still treasure... Yes, I'm right in the bush, but I'm only oh, yes. five minutes from the ocean. I still uh, have and treasure a photo you signed for me, I think, when I was nine years old, and I have it in a frame on top of the piano to this very day. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. And I must tell you, your voice is ageless. Oh, well, that's nice to know. Patricia, speaking of your voice, let's go back in time with a recording of you in action in, uh, uh, I think, a radio comedy, in fact. Let's hear it now. Right. The Shell Show. Welcome to another Shell Show for 1947. Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Pym saying, how do you do, and hoping you'll enjoy the 45 full minutes of entertainment we have for you tonight. And now, here is a simple domestic scene played by Charles Norman, Patricia Kennedy and Frank Rich that could happen to any married couple. It could even happen to you. The Hackett's have retired. Mrs. Hackett wrestles with the bedclothes in sympathetic agony as her poor husband, a victim of a rare form of insomnia which manifests itself in alternate periods of coma and wakefulness, reaches an acute stage of the ailment. Listen. <coughs> Now he's scaring himself to death. <laughs> Charles! Charles, are you in pain? Are you in pain, Blanche? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, Blanche? Stop repeating everything I say like a parrot. Why do you repeat everything I say? Why do you repeat everything I say, Blanche? I'm not. Why do you repeat everything I say? You just said that. Oh, I, I did. Oh, why don't you let me sleep? You know I've got to get up early. I won't let you sleep because when you go to sleep, you snore and you wake me and then I'll wake you and we'll argue. I promise I won't snore. Oh, you always snore week in and week out. On Monday, you snore. Tuesday, you snore. Wednesday, you snore. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you snore. So what do you do tonight? <laughs> What's the use? <laughs> oh, he's having that dream again. Charles, you said you wouldn't snore. Yes, dear. Turn over on the other side. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. <gasps> what was that? I didn't say anything. That was a car backfiring. Oh. Charles, I have indigestion. I've never been so sick in all my life. All right, Blanche. I'm awake now. What's the matter? I don't feel well, Charles. Call the doctor. You don't need a doctor. I'll handle it. Where does it hurt you? Right here in the pit of my stomach. It's a shooting pain. It comes about every five minutes. How long does it last? At least a quarter of an hour. Now, how can it last a quarter of an hour when it comes only every five minutes? <laughs> don't yell at me. I'm sick. If I say the pain lasts a quarter of an hour, it lasts a quarter of an hour. Okay. I think it's 
the dinner we had at the Wilsons. The fish didn't agree with me. Oh, it wouldn't dare. I never want to eat at that place again. Every mouthful was poison, and the helpings were so small. You ate as if you were condemned. Well, you have to be polite when you go out to dinner. I wish we hadn't eaten anything. I'm suffering. Call the doctor. Now, don't get hysterical. It's just indigestion. I know how to treat it. I'll get you some hot ginger ale and oatmeal. Hot ginger ale? Yeah, it'll make a man of you. Charles, I don't want any of your insane remedies. If you treat me for indigestion, I'll probably die of liver trouble. Look, if I treat you for indigestion, you'll die of indigestion. <laughs> Do you want me to help you or not? Not if you're going to yell at me. You wouldn't yell at Gloria Wilson if she got sick. Now, don't start on Gloria. I saw you two at the dinner table playing footsies. Footsies? You were so flustered when she spoke to you, you couldn't eat. I wasn't flustered. Why did you pour gravy over your ice cream? I always put gravy on my ice cream. I love gravy on everything, and you know it. A likely story. And the frock that woman was wearing, she ought to be arrested. I think she purposely swallowed that fish spoon so you could stroke her back. I didn't stroke her back. I patted it, and I'd have done it if she hadn't swallowed the fish bone. I mean, if she hadn't have been wearing that frock. I don't know how poor Bob stands for it. A lot you care what happens to me. Every time Gloria gets a headache, Bob, Bob hugs and kisses and falls all over her. Why don't you do that? I'm never there when she has a headache. I mean, why don't you fuss over me? Now, listen to me, Blanche. You're not sick, and you know it. Oh, I'm depressed, and you're going out of town tomorrow, and I'll be so lonesome, I'll die. I'm only going overnight. I'll be back the next day. Suppose a burglar broke into the house and found me. It'd serve him right. <laughs> now, let me sleep, Blanche. I have to get an early train. We've never been separated before. I'm afraid absence will conquer your love. Oh, no. The longer I'm away from you, the better I like you. I don't like the way that sounded. Oh, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's the most stupid saying in the world. Why? Well, look what happened to Frank Shaw. He left his wife for two weeks and now he's the unhappiest man in the world. And you know why? Yeah, she was still there when he came home. <laughs> she was not. Louise got lonesome and ran off with the upholsterer. When Frank came home and found what happened, he went out and got so drunk they had to take him to a hospital. Well, he ought to be ashamed of himself. Why? Well, a man ought to wait at least a week before celebrating. <laughs> oh, good night. Don't be so smart. You might come home and find things changed here, too. Mm -mm. Go on. Stay away from home for a month. Stay away for a year. See if I care. I'm only going for one day. Run all over the country. Go home to England. Never let me know where you are. Just keep me here wondering whether you're alive or dead. Blanche! Why don't you write to me, Charles? Now, listen, Bum. <laughs> you have only one object in mind, and that is to keep me awake. I just want you to tell me you love me. Oh. How much do you love me? Okay, how much do you want? Five pounds. Yeah. I saw the most stunning hat, Charles. If I get it, I'm sure I won't be so depressed. Five pounds for a hat? That's a fine cure for depression. That'll start one. Oh, I hate you. How oh, my mother begged me not to marry you. She pleaded with me not to marry you. Your mother told you not to marry me? Yes, she did. How I've misjudged that woman. Oh, you'll be sorry for this. You just wait. Oh, Blanche, I'm so tired, I have to catch the seven o'clock train. That means I've got to get up before six. Why do you need so much time? I have to pack my suitcase, don't I? You haven't got a suitcase. Oh, yes, I have. I bought a brand new one yesterday. It's in the cupboard. No, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. I put it there myself last night. I took it out this morning. What? Andy borrowed it. <laughs> oh, Blanche, you didn't. You didn't let that weasel, that brother of yours, take my brand new suitcase. I've never even used it. Don't scream so. You can carry your stuff in a paper bag. Paper bag? My suits will get crushed. No, they won't. Andy borrowed those, too. <laughs> now, look here, Blanche. I see no reason for you to carry on like this. Andy's going on a long trip with some businessmen, and he won't hurt your old suitcase. He has to have something to bring the fish home in. <laughs> oh, he's going to carry fish in my suitcase, and I have to carry my suits in brown paper? Well, stay home, then. I can't stay home. If you leave me alone in this horrid house tomorrow night, I'll... All right, all right. I'll call Andy. I'll have him come over and stay till I come back. Uh, put on the light. <laughs> Honest Blanche, if I don't go on this trip tomorrow, I'm liable to lose my job. Hello! Uh, this is Charles, Andy. Hello, what's new? Look, I want to ask a little favor. I have to go out of town tomorrow, and Blanche is afraid to stay here alone. Could you come over and spend the night? Okay, Charles, I'll be over tomorrow. Okay, Andy. And uh, when you come over, you might bring my new suitcase with you. <laughs> I might, but I won't, because I've hocked it already. Good night. <laughs> How I hate that man. See what you make me go through because you pretend to be scared of staying alone? I won't be alone. Mother's coming to stay with us for the rest of the year. Good night, Charles. Uh... Patricia Kennedy in action from the Shell Show of 1947. 46 years ago, Patricia. Remember that show? Are you sure that was me? That was you. Yes, it was. Absolutely no remembrance of doing that show at all.
Isn't that funny, you know? I suppose it's a bit like doing commercials. You can you can go and read a commercial in a studio, and then half an hour later, you'll forget th what you've done. That's right. That's right. But I remember dear, dear Frank Rich and, and Wally Pym, of course, very well. Both both dead now. Yes, indeed. Yes. yes. How did you get into radio? We go back before the, the, the days that you graced the, the microphone. What were you doing, uh, Patricia? Well, um, I, I, I was teaching in a primary school, um, but I'd always, you know, I, I'd always been very interested in, in words, actually, from the time I was a very small child. I loved the sound of words. So, um, um, you know, after, after I'd uh, finished my formal ed education, um, I was working with a teacher in... Uh, in Melbourne, um, just really to you know, just just to to enjoy um, um, speaking lines and and doing poetry and and and, and prose and so on. And uh, she had a little uh, drama group um, in in her studio, and I worked with her there. I'd never really thought I could become a professional actor because I thought that was a very special gift that was given to some people, not necessarily to me. But um, whenever she did shows, she always gave me very good roles and so on. And so I, I, I had reached the stage where I really felt, yes, that I could become a professional actor, and I was aiming at the theatre. But radio at that time was just um, just burgeoning, uh, commercial uh, radio and, and, and doing drama. And um, actually, that very same Walter Pym, whom we, whom we just heard on that recording, came to a performance that I was in, uh, in this uh, studio where I was working, and he asked me to come down to the studio and give him an audition. And he actually gave me a job uh, in a play at 3XY, oh. and that 3, uh, 3UZ he was with at that time. Oh. But, did, did... Actually, the first, uh, before he actually gave me that job, the first job that I got in radio, it was rather strange because here I'd been training to become an actor and become myself, as I hoped, uh, and... and 3XY three, three at that time were doing a long-running uh, serial called One Man's Family. Now, it was enormously popular. It had the same popularity then as, say, Neighbours on television, which yes. is now. What years are we talking of, Patricia? Oh, we're talking about mid-30s. Mid-30s. And 3XY um, uh, had a drama unit there. And um, One Man's Family was one of their long-running serials. And there was an actress in it named Catherine Neal who was playing um, the leading woman's role. I think she was playing the mother of, the, of this family. And she was going away on a holiday and they had to get somebody to replace her. And so they auditioned a few people. Now, my, I, I was younger than Catherine and uh, her voice was much darker than mine and she had a very measured kind of delivery, which was not difficult to imitate, actually. So I, they auditioned me and they gave me the job. And so I actually went on air for the first time in front of a microphone at 3XY imitating another actress, <laughs> which was rather a strange. Wonderful story. Exactly. Did your parents approve of you going into show business, Patricia? Say that again. Did your parents approve of you going into radio? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. And, and they were very helpful. But my mother, you know, if my mother had, had grown up in a different generation, I'm sure she would have gone into the theatre because she had a great gift of words and expression and, and emotion and so on. Well, that's where you got it from, Patricia. I guess. I guess. Yes. What about national radio programs? And I'm speaking of the Lux Theatre and Caltex and General Motors Hour. Yes. Well, I mean, when they came along, that, that was really a great thing for the actors uh, when Harry Durst started his Lux Radio Theatre. And then we had the General Motors Hour with that wonderful 3AW personality with the ch brown chocolate voice, Terry Deer. Uh, and he used to present the, the General Motors Hour. You're speaking of Bruce's uncle now, Patricia. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Really? That's right. Oh, that's nice to know. Yes, he's living in Sydney now, uh, Patricia. You see? Yes. You see? Oh, we all had a great regard for Terry. He oh, that's lovely to hear. A very sweet man. Thank you. Um, let's talk about the serials. Were you... Well, we've spoken to Diana Shearing in Sydney, and she relays the story that on any given morning she'd be in the Blythe Street studios of AWA and rushing around the corner to Grace Gibson to do the next episode of Dr. Paul. Was it much the same for you in Melbourne? It was very much the same in Melbourne, and in fact, even more so, but because the pool of, of um, you know, very... Um, 
competent actors was smaller in Melbourne than it was in Sydney. And so a group of about, you know, 12 of us, I suppose, moved around from studio to studio, uh, almost like, um, um, you know, like a little drama company. Name some of them for us, Patricia. Some of the actors. Yes. Your fellow actors? My, well, there was um, Mary Ward, uh, Mary Disney, uh, Douglas Kelly, Keith Eden, uh, Robert Bernard, Reg Goldsworthy, um, uh, my mum, who else? Oh, I said Douglas Kelly. Sid Conabeer, I suppose. Conabeer, Richard Davies. Yes, a, a lot of them have, have already died. Yes. What are some of the shows, too, Patricia, that you did locally? Well, some of the serials, I used to come on every morning saying, Sincerely, Rita Marsden. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that came on on 3DB, at, you know, quite early, in, or 9 o'clock, I think, in the morning. Um, oh, I did Consider Your Verdict, um, A Man Called Shepherd, uh, David's Children, Out of the Dark. Even did some episodes of When a Girl Marries when I was in, in Sydney for a while. Um, Dick Barton, special agent, of course. <laughs> I probably played somebody's mole in that. I, I, I know that I, I, I was at one time. I was I was in about seven serials at the one time that were that were playing. You know, around the around the well, around the nation actually. Was there much rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne as far as actors went, and uh, for for gaining uh, you know prestige parts in different plays and serials? Well, I don't think so, really. We we actually operated as two separate uh, entities. It was only when um, you know, Harry just took me up to Sydney several times to do a Lux radio thing that that we we came together. Um, other than that, we worked quite you know quite separately. And I don't think that there was any um, you know any bad feeling or or any enmity either between Sydney and Melbourne or, or between the actors themselves. I mean, there was a really Great. One of the great things about um, commercial radio drama in those days was there's a wonderful camaraderie between the actors. There was a really very, very good feeling, you know, and, and that's why actors worked so well together in the studio because we knew each other well and we knew how each one worked and we made way for each other at the microphone and all that sort of thing, you know, when we were working so quickly. We we did we used to do the same thing. We used to come into the into the studio for Dorothy Crawford at half past eight in the morning. And, and work with her till perhaps midday, and then uh, you know, in the, perhaps you had a, an ABC rehearsal in the afternoon, and then later in the day you might have to go out to uh, Smith Street, Collingwood, where Morris West first opened his studio, and uh, you know you have to rush out there. Um, so we we were on the go in the same way. And I remember when we when we started, we got ten and sixpence per episode. It sounds really rather ridiculous, but I mean, I suppose it was in in a ratio with what the uh, the cost of living was at the time. But Patricia, have you been able to uh, just get a collection of some of your work on radio at all together? Well, the, the only the only things I had, I, I had a Lux Radio uh, a thing where I won an award that Jane Wyman gave uh, to the Lux Radio people uh, that for o over six weeks. They had to play uh, over six, every, every Sunday for, for six weeks, and I won that particular award. And uh, there was a very really big, big presentation night. In how lovely! How lovely that would be as a, as a memento. But what I, I... Uh, yeah, I no, I haven't got them. So it, it, it's it's in the National Archive. I see. Yes. Well, that's nice to even have in there. But uh, if you'd explain just that wonderful romantic feeling in the air doing a Sunday night live drama in front of a studio audience um, and broadcast around Australia, that must have been tremendous. Well, it was. I mean, it was a great, great, uh, you know, it was a great feeling uh, to know that I mean, it, was, it was terribly nerve-wracking, of course, because we went, you know, live on to air. And, uh, you know, if you, you couldn't really afford to be making a mistake. Um, but it was a really great, uh, great feeling, uh, knowing the whole of Australia was listening. And, and everybody used to rush. If you were out playing tennis on a Sunday or something, you would always be home in time to hear the Lux Radio Theatre at oh, yeah. 8 o'clock. You know. Was it unusual for an actress who entered a theatre normally, goes to make-up, rehearses, and then goes on and does the same show for six weeks, opposed to a radio actress who arrives with a script and goes straight to microphone without any of the, the action, so to speak. Yes, well, um, 
of course, in, in, in the theatre, the, the good thing is that you do have, you know, a longer time to prepare, and when the show goes on, you know, you're still working on the role because you've got a different audience every night and you find out what the audience reaction is to this and to that and so on. And so you, you, you have time to develop the character much, much more. Um, but there was a sort of, you know, there was a sort of wonderful excitement, I suppose, about going, um, about going, you know, straight on, onto air live. Uh, Patricia, on another occasion, Patricia Kennedy, our special guest, will talk about your TV and theatre triumphs. Did you enjoy going home listening to your radio serials? No, I didn't. Being broadcast? No, no, and I very rarely listened, actually. I mean, sometimes I just listened if I was unsure and I wanted to check up about something, but no, I didn't. Uh... You wouldn't go home for sincerely Rita Marsden, for example? Oh no! I'm not, I, well, that was on. I was re, I was busy doing something else. It would have been quite, you know, quite different. Well, I must say, it's been a great pleasure and a thrill for me personally, and I know for Phil to speak to you tonight, Patricia, because we do hold you in very high regard when we we speak of the radio, and we're excluding there your triumphs on stage, and and we'll cover those on another occasion, Patricia. All right. Television and and theatre work. Okay. And a joy for us to talk to you about the golden days of television, and you were very much a part of them. And, and of radio. Thank you. Sincerely yours, Patricia Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs>